So we've got a lot to get through in terms of the agenda. Um, and so I'm not going to go through it uh, all right now, but we're going to be talking about what community champions are. We will be uh, then going off to, to look at the key messages for today and for the next uh, few weeks going forward. Um, and also a chance to, to talk about things like test and trace, uh, what's happening in terms of the flu vaccine for us. And there'll be a chance for everybody to feed back um, at the end of today. Next slide. We thought uh, we'll give you some feedback of how it's been operating in SLA for those that are not part of charities and community groups. And whilst we've been doing this for the last six months, uh, I've got some numbers for August. But just August, we helped 1,443 people as a collective, all the charities and community groups of SLA and all of the volunteers. Um, 806 food parcels were delivered, 737 prescriptions were picked up and delivered to people's homes. Uh, there was 192 shopping delivered. A lot of this was to all the people that were vulnerable in one way or another, and 137 people were befriended. Next slide, please. So this is also a chance uh, for me to say thank you to everybody that's been part of that voluntary and community sector one slow response. Um, uh, and you've done some amazing work that way. And if you've joined us for the first time as a community champion, um, uh, I want to thank you for becoming a community champion and just to let you know that, that what you will be doing is making a big difference in Slough going forward. If there is a second wave, uh, you will be vital to making sure that residents of Slough are protected. Next slide, please. So I asked uh, Martin, what's a one slough champion? And he said, they're basically town criers. Uh, these are from Chester, but obviously we'll want them from slough. And if we're lucky, we might actually uh, get uh, some real ones from slough and have pictures for the next time. But what does a one slough champion town crier do? Next slide, please. And there are four things. Number one, sign up to be a champion. Where? at oneslough.gov.uk and if you can uh, please uh, ask your colleagues and friends uh, that have got Facebook accounts that are influential in the community in one way or another or just have uh, a, a passion for uh, social media and connecting with other people in Slough to sign up uh, and then we can grow the number that we've got currently we've got uh, 407 uh, champions in Slough. We need about 500 to make a huge impact. My original target was 250. Lorna surpassed that already. Next one is 500. Uh, and with your help, we can reach 500. Please pass on that message to everybody else to sign up. So one, sign up to have a champion. Two, we will give champions the latest information about COVID-19. We'll bring experts in from public health on a regular basis to give you the information that's up to date about what you might need to protect yourself and keep your family and your friends and your community safe. Number three, champions then share that information with anybody else in their community, any way that you want. And number four, uh, please sort of feed back to us. So if we've given you messages that are too complicated or people may not understand, you can go on to the oneslough.gov.uk uh, website and feed back to us uh, with any kind of feedback or comments that would help to improve this particular service. Next slide, please. So here are the two websites. If you want to stay informed, one way to do that is to visit oneslough.org.uk. Uh, and the other way is to go to the Public Health Slough website, which is publichealthslough.co.uk uh, backslash campaigns backslash one slap and you can get a huge range of resources that are on there as well with key messages that you can then pass on to your friends, families and the community. So next slide please and now I'm going to pass it on to Tim uh, to give you the very important messages on how Slough can stay safe over the next few weeks. Tim take it away. 
Perfect. Thanks very much, Ramesh. Um, so I'm going to cover probably a fair amount um, in the next couple of slides um, from, a, from a health perspective. Um, I'm going to whiz through fairly quickly. So if there's questions, uh, I'd rather sort of pick up the questions at the, at the end um, so that we're not dwelling too much on slides or boring you with slides. Um, there's, uh, we're, we're going to be sharing the presentation after this, so um, you'll, you'll be able to go through it in a bit more detail. And obviously, then if you've got more questions after that, then we're always open for, for questions and feedback. Just to, to start with um, the, the, so the sort of the more depressing side of, uh, of our presentation today, and this was to give you a live picture of um, COVID cases in Slough. So, for those of you that have been following the press fairly closely, um, you'll know that uh, COVID cases are increasing in Slough um, and they're actually rising uh, exponentially so that we have a, we've had a large increase of cases. Uh, to put that in numbers, uh, last Thursday, so a week ago, uh, we were on 18 cases per 100,000 of our population. Uh, today, we're just shy of 70 cases per 100,000. Um, so in a week, uh, we've jumped uh, substantially. This has put us on um, the radar of Public Health England um, and put us under a bit of a microscope um, because uh, this is a concern that the cases are rate rising uh, and we're not uh, maybe as under control as we were over the summer. If you're interested in how that relates to other areas, uh, so places like Blackburn and Darwin, um, they are around about 300 per 100,000. Um, so we've got a long way to go till we go anywhere near um, what we class as a, you know, a local lockdown or an, you know, um, substantial problem. Um, but it is causing us uh, concern because we, we obviously we don't want to go into the winter with with high numbers of cases, and we don't want to see these cases translated into hospital admissions. Um, again, a little bit more in, information into our local picture. Um, half of our cases, roughly half our cases, are. Uh, specific to household clusters, which is where we may have a child brings a case back into a, a family home and then it spreads amongst the family. Uh, others, um, uh, the other half of our sort of cases are general community transmission, which is what's presenting us a bit more of a risk because it's much harder for us to, to uh, crack down on, on general cases where we don't have a picture of where they've come from. Um, or where we can't um, trace uh, the, the, the outbreak. So that's a concern. Uh, in terms of general demographics, et cetera, we know that our, our BAME communities, so our Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups have been disproportionately impacted on from COVID. That's both in numbers of cases and premature mortality. Uh, and that is replicating itself in the new cases. Um, and in terms of age groups, we're, we're looking at more working, working age adults. So as schools started back, we, we had an increase of cases amongst uh, younger people. Um, that's now translated more into, into working age adults, pretty much between 18 and 64. Um, the concern with all of this uh, at the moment, um, it, it's not a big concern in terms of health outcomes because we know that younger people are generally um, fare better with COVID. However, the concern is that it translates into our older adults and those that are more at risk. So it just adds uh, emphasis that we, we need to be protecting uh, the most vulnerable um, and we need to continue doing that for, the, for this coming winter. So on the screen, I've just left you know, the standard messages, which I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you are pretty bored by already. Uh, the, the three key things, hands, face, space. Um, I, I can't, I'm not gonna go into any detail because you will be already bored out of this. And we know that there's an element of a messaging fatigue, but I've put that on there just to re-emphasize the important things. Those are, those are the three key things that we can all do to, to prevent that increase in, in cases. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Um, the next slide uh, I've put on here just to give you an idea of the resources that's available to people. Um, so there's an organization that we've been working with, um, which have created a huge range of infographics um, they're, they're a group of doctors and nurses, uh, people from across the NHS that have come out and, and have been able to translate uh, a massive amount of resources. Um, so we now pretty much have access to any information about COVID in pretty much any language. Um, it's about 30, 35 different languages we have access to. So if, if any of you are wanting uh, tailored resources that are in different languages, um, uh, we'll, put, we'll provide the details of where you can access those we'll share that with all of you um, and you know hopefully we can use those to, to target different elements of our, of our communities 
obviously if there's something missing if there's something that we you think we need or if there's a language that we need then again please pass that information back to us and we can we can get that uh, translated and worked on uh, the, the slide I have left on the screen um, does touch on myth busting um, and I wanted to add this on there really to, to give you an idea of um, some of the other challenges that we face with COVID. So we know that there's an element of, of messaging fatigue. We know people are a bit fed up of, of the constant uh, barrage of COVID information. But some of the challenges that we still face within our communities is there is a lot of myths um, that um, still surround COVID. Some of those I've left on the screen uh, and we've got, we've got these tailored resources to help overcome some of those. Uh, and again, they're in the different languages uh, for people to use. Okay, next slide. So for, for, uh, for me, this is, this is for me, it's a bit more bread and butter public health uh, that we've been more involved with over the, you know, uh, the last couple of years. And for those of you that follow any of the work that we do from public health, you'll know that we talk about these things uh, in a fair amount of detail. However, what I'm going to do now is hopefully provide you a little, some more uh, kind of new information that's relating some of our health outcomes uh, with COVID. So there's four key uh, risk factors um, that have kind of, um, kind of come to light uh, out of COVID, things that are both leading to worse outcomes from the virus, but also the, these kind of indirect outcomes uh, of uh, the pandemic. So those four things are physical inactivity, uh, weight management, smoking cessation or, or smoking, uh, and mental health outcomes. And I'm going to go through each one just in a little bit of detail, just to provide you a little bit more information about them. So flick to the next slide. So uh, for me, uh, the, the, the really obvious one, uh, and hopefully some of you have seen the messages for this, is about moving more, physical inactivity. So we know that, uh, that uh, physical inactivity contributes to uh, well over 10 to 15% of deaths across the UK every single year, and that's contributing towards various different diseases, non-communicable diseases. In the light of COVID, we know that physical activity is absolutely crucial. Um, regular daily ex ex exercise and activities is great for your immune system. Uh, and we know it's a direct, direct contributing factor to obesity, which is also leading to worse outcomes. So we launched this campaign two weeks ago called hashtag fit to fight COVID. And this was just really giving residents that kind of knowledge and understanding of the importance of uh, moving more in the light of COVID. Okay, next slide. Uh, the, the, the biggest risk factor for COVID in terms of our own health, um, and that's both risk factors for catching the virus, being admitted to hospital from the virus and from passing away because of the virus, is obesity. Um, and that's for, due to uh, numerous reasons. The first is the fact that obesity is very closely linked with long-term health conditions such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, etc. And we know those things are leading to worse outcomes from coronavirus. But we also know that obesity presents an issue with your immune system. We know that people that are, are overweight, so an unhealthy weight, uh, have worse immune systems. Um, so we know that it, the, um, the benefits of maintaining a healthy weight, not only beneficial in your general health and general uh, kind of well-being, but also, are also really important in terms of uh, coronavirus. So we offer uh, you know, a huge range of support services to residents. We offer weight management programs for free. All of this is free. Um, and I think one of the things I'd like to get across to, to all of you as champions is, is, is to understand the importance that obesity uh, kind of plays in this pandemic. And if there was one thing that I would tell a resident that uh, maybe you know, we, we've got past that messaging fatigue, um, for me, the messaging should be, let's look at your long-term health. How, how are you setting yourself up for this winter? How are you setting yourself up for the next six to 12 months when we know that coronavirus is still there? So actually, what's the best way we can support our immune systems so that if we do catch the virus, you know, we're, we're, we're giving ourselves the best chance. And for me, that's uh, maintaining a healthy weight. Okay, next slide. Uh, the third one and the, the more obvious one uh, is smoking. And I don't, I'm not going to dwell into this too much, but just to say that uh, a million people have quit smoking since the beginning of the pandemic um, because we know that um, uh, the, the impact that smoking is having on intensive care admission um, and, and just generally on your immune system. And just to say that, again, we, we offer a range of support for people, um, all free of charge. So if people want to access the service, it's there for you to access. 
Uh, next slide. So this one, uh, this for me is a really important one, uh, and I try and talk about mental health in every uh, kind of webinar or, or session or presentation I deliver because it is really, really important. And it's one of the things that we we tend to we tend to neglect. We talk about our physical health a lot. We talk about what we can do to you know health, whether it's healthy eating, whether it's about brushing our teeth, whether it's about getting vaccinated, but we don't talk enough about mental health. And we know that since the beginning of the pandemic, or well, with lockdown that anxiety has increased, we know that uh, depression has increased, and that's you know, caused by numerous reasons, whether it's, whether it's directly because of the fear about the, the virus itself, or it's simply because we're, we're now less, less, less physically active, we're spending more time indoors, we're spending less time socialising with other people. We know that's really important. So I put on the screen the five ways to well-being. Uh, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in, in mental health and, and you're wanting to learn a little bit more about what we can all do to, to have positive or good mental uh, health, have a look at the five ways to well-being. There's a huge range of other resources out there for people. So if people do want more tailored support, whether you want to talk to a therapist, uh, whether you want to access NHS services, all that support's available to you. And I've left the link on this slide uh, for, for that kind of more information. Okay, we're whizzing through. Next slide. You can go. Perfect. So this is a sometimes a bit of a contentious topic, um, but one of the other things that I do in a, for my public health role is I lead on uh, our kind of health protection work um, for immunisations and what's what's otherwise known as communicable diseases, so diseases that are, are passed from um, human to human you can catch. Uh, and for me, the biggest one for this coming winter is influenza, so it's flu. Uh, I think um, if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk through it in a little bit more detail just to explain why I'm talking about this on a COVID call and why in the light of coronavirus it's important. Um, and I'm hoping that most of you will have probably seen all the messaging nationally around uh, the importance of the, the flu vaccine uh, for this coming winter. So why is it important? I think for me, there's three key reasons why we're now talking about flu in the light of COVID. So evidence, it, it's, well, modeling is showing us that the flu season, uh, so this coming flu season is likely to coincide with a second COVID peak. So we, we're already seeing an increase in cases nationally, uh, and we're expecting to see a peak at about the same time as we see a peak in the flu season. And that's an issue for, for numerous reasons. So one is that uh, both presenters having similar symptoms, so both have upper respiratory tract infections. And we know that that's a problem uh, both for uh, admissions to hospital, admissions to uh, both GPs and hospitals, uh, and also on testing. It's putting a pressure on uh, capacity for testing. So we, we know that uh, there's been some uh, national issues with uh, testing and access issues to testing. And what we don't want is a load of people in October, November, and December uh, trying to access a COVID test when actually they've just got flu. Um, well, I say just got, when they've got flu. Um, and actually they should be, you know, um, relieving the, the, the capacity on testing through getting vaccinated. So the more people that we have vaccinated from the flu, uh, the less pressures they'll be on, on uh, COVID testing. And also that double whammy. So what we don't want is come midwinter, the NHS is having to deal with flu outbreaks uh, and COVID outbreaks at the same time. Um, we, we'd rather they have all that uh, kind of emphasis on COVID. Uh, meanwhile, we've uh, kind of reduced the numbers of people with, with uh, flu. So uh, what's the NHS doing? So the NHS is increasing numbers of people that can get vaccinated from 15 million to 30 million. Uh, they're aiming to target up to 75% well, of each um, category of people that can get vaccinated. So people that are over 65 um, or over 50 later in the year. Uh, people with long-term health conditions, pregnant women, uh, primary school aged children, carers, healthcare workers, etc. So there's a massive drive to get them, as many people vaccinated as we possibly can uh, and that will help protect the NHS uh, and save lives. Just so from a personal perspective, if you're interested, one of the challenges uh, that we, we're also going to face is that uh, if we have people catching either coronavirus or influenza, what we don't want is people catching both at the same time because we know that their outcomes will be substantially worse. Yeah. So if you can get vaccinated, please get vaccinated. Um, it's available to massive numbers of people. And if you, okay. if you don't fall into the free category for a free vaccine, 
um, you can pay for a vaccine at a local pharmacy for around about £10. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you can, please do. Uh, if you've got any questions, any, any queries about the vaccine, um, then I'm always here uh, to answer those and uh, hopefully to allay any concerns that people might have. Okay, uh, next slide. So the last two slides uh, for, from me for this session are on NHS Test and Trace. Um, so I've touched on um, the, the challenges that we face around um, tracing the virus, especially when it's general community transmission and not linked to household or it's not linked to an outbreak per se. Uh, and the way that we are able to, the, the way that we trace community transmission and the way that we are able to isolate the virus is through uh, NHS Test and Trace. So in Slough, there's two, two kind of levels of uh, NHS test and trace. We have, um, we have the national NHS system, which is where we have a national uh, group of contact tracers who will contact you if you've tested positive, and they'll also contact you if you've been in contact with someone that is positive, uh, and their role is to take people's details, to inform you of uh, the person you come into contact with, to isolate uh, for the relevant time, uh, and to support that journey. In Slough, uh, we also have a local contact tracing team uh, that are based uh, in the council, uh, a mixture of public health and environmental services team. Uh, and their role is to pick up any of those people that aren't supported through the national system. Uh, so we know that uh, you know, a national call centre based in uh, the Midlands, for example, isn't going to know Slough uh, like uh, local residents do. We also isn't going to know uh, local you know, demographics and languages spoken, etc. So the idea of having this local system and local service uh, there is to support local residents uh, and, and hopefully be able to get, uh, to get more contacts, um, which, will, which will help us uh, in terms of isolating the virus. Uh, the other element of the NHS Test and Trace Scheme is the app. So if we just skip on to the next slide, which is my uh, penultimate slide. Um, the, the app uh, which launched last Thursday, so NHS app, um, this is an app available to absolutely everyone and I would implore if you have employee if you haven't downloaded it already please download it um, onto your phone either Android or, or iPhone uh, and the app is there to serve, serve a purpose for numerous different reasons. So one is it, it can provide you with a direct access to, to, to testing so you can book a test, gives you the information about isolating and, and your symptoms but crucially, it allows you to a check in to, to venues, so where you might notice um, what's called a QR code uh, on venues, which is that black box with the little dots, etc. So where the venues have started using those, it allows you to, to scan it with your app and to check in. And then what it, what it also does is it also uses Bluetooth technology to, to see if you've come into contact with someone that's positive for COVID. It will then alert you and it will say, you've come into contact with someone with, which is positive for COVID uh, and the, the advice then is to isolate uh, for that period. Now, the only way this app works is uh, with as many people uh, having access to it as possible. And for those of you that are interested, I think there's nearly 15 million people across the UK that have already downloaded it. And it's the number one downloaded app of all time in the UK um, or the quickest um, app to get to that number in the UK, which is fantastic. But obviously, the, the more people that we have downloading it, the better. And it means we're, we're better able to uh, isolate the virus uh, and support the people, uh, uh, kind of um, support the most vulnerable groups. Again, just one last thing before I, uh, I switch on to the next section, which is on questions and answers. One of the things that we're now able to do in Slough, um, thanks to some great work at NHS England and, and colleagues in um, Slough GPs and across the system, we're able to better support people if they do get if they do contract the virus. So we've been one of the tar one of the uh, pilot areas in the southeast um, to provide an enhanced level of support to residents if they do come uh, get contract the virus. So what happens if you test positive? Uh, you get direct contact with your GP. You'll then risk assess to find out if you are a high risk of the virus uh, in terms of uh, outcomes. And if you are, you're provided with what's called a pulse oximeter, which is a little thing that sticks onto your finger and that tracks your blood oxygen uptake. Uh, and what that, that enables us to do is it allows you to see how that patient is progressing uh, and how, the, uh, how you're kind of uh, coping with the virus. 
So what it means is that as soon as that blood oxygen drops below a certain level, that person can get admitted to hospital much, much sooner. Uh, and the reason that that's important is because evidence from the first peak has shown that actually the quicker you can get someone into hospital, the quicker that you can provide them with uh, emergency care, whether it's uh, oxygen or ventilator, the better their outcomes are going to be. So that's one of the other things that's going on in the background in Slough and, and um, the ways that the way we're able to kind of um, better support residents. And I think that's uh, that's it. So I've, I've whizzed through in um, 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, I think the next slide is uh, questions and comments. Timothy, thank you very much for uh, all that information. There's quite a lot to take in there. It's amazing. Um, stuff that we need to take in. I noticed that uh, Martin Carter's hand is up, so I will ask him to come in and ask a question, but I've got two questions before we get there. I noticed that nobody's put any things in the, the chat bit. Um, hopefully that's working. And then I've got one more person after that, um, Mabu, who wants to ask the question as well. But let me ask my two questions first. Uh, the first question is, my Tim, my aunt, um, has put onions around in the living room, all right, and various places in the house because she's convinced that will uh, fight off COVID. Is there any truth from public health in that myth, or is it a fact? Well, uh, yeah, good question, and, and I think, uh, in fact, that is one of the myths I think that's covered in that uh, slide that I showed earlier. So that is it's a common myth, and it's, it's something that's existed for probably hundreds of years um, that um, people think that it fights off colds, flu, uh, and now coronavirus it is unfortunately a myth um, and it it definitely doesn't and there's no evidence to suggest that it does um the second question is I've, i noticed that we've got the university of the third age uh listening in here and they're a great community champion because they're linked to hundreds and hundreds of uh people um that are in the right category for me which is the very vulnerable who are possibly going to be over 65. I know that there'll be other people who may not be, but uh, that's a great. Is there one simple message that you may want to say to them? Is it about get a flu jab over the next few months, or would it be about the, the you know, the hands, face, and space bit? What, what would be the one key message from everything that you said that you would want them? The one key message, that's a, yeah, that's a difficult question to answer quickly. I think for me, there's two separate messages. I think there's the immediate COVID messages. So that's, you're, you're right in saying that's a hands, face, space. And that's, you know, we've heard that uh, all the time. And then, then there's a second chunk of messages uh, that um, would be, how can I look after my own health um, going into winter? And you're right, for me, that's the flu jab and that's um, physical activity. Okay, thank you. So, Martin, um, you've got your hand up. I'm trying to unmute you. I don't know whether you can do it yourself. Yep. I can. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a short correction. I know it's been corrected in the slides, but at the beginning we were giving out the wrong web address. So the correct web address for One Slough is oneslough.org.uk. And that will become more and more important because we will be sharing more and more details for people who are One Slough community champions. More information on that will follow about how you'll be able to log in and get access. And I'm gonna repeat what uh, Ramesh and Tim said earlier. The one thing that a community champion is, is someone who can get the message out to the widest possible audience. And the message is factual information about COVID. That's the key thing that we're trying to uh, uh, disseminate using this audience. Great, thanks Martin. And I've got a question from Mabu Shay. If you can tell us where you're from uh, and the question. Okay, uh, I'm from Wexham. Um, hope you can hear me now. Yeah. Um, yep. So the question I had is, I mean, it's all good work. I have seen some uh, leafleting on the mental health. Uh, I want to pick on that subject, please, if that's okay. I see that uh, it's all the material is in English. Um, obviously, there are many people maybe needing some kind of a multilingual um, uh, leaflets, uh, one thing. The other thing is, um, because, because of this lockdown and various other things, um, would it be better if uh, these leaflets are delivered 
to the households you know as much as possible so maybe i'm targeting some of the elderly probably into their 50s 60s 70s and needing some kind of a you know uh, uh, advice on how they can keep them mentally fit um mm-hmm. so that's all i wanted to ask really yeah no that's uh, yeah great great questions um i'll just pick up on a couple of things and then ramesh if you want to jump in after um so if there's any material that uh, that you think is needed or missing that maybe could be translated uh, then just feed that back to us and we can certainly look at uh, getting that done the the, the organization that we work with that's got all the covid information uh, some of that picks up on both physical health and mental health and that's all translatable into 30 35 different languages um, and we can again we can certainly look at um, any bespoke material that might need to be done um, and then in terms of um, uh, your, your second question um, in terms of uh, leaflet drops um, the council is I think probably later in October we've got a, a, a brochure that's going to be pretty much dedicated to health outcomes um, both physical health mental health uh, COVID winter preparedness all that sort of stuff uh, and that's going out to every resident uh, in Slough so that will be I think yeah at some point in October thank you and I've got a question from Anita Balani, if you could say where you're from, Anita. Yeah. Hello. Yes, uh, I'm Anita Balani. I run a small community group alongside uh, with U3A. Um, our, our group is, again, similar category to U3A, elderly ladies. Uh, they are old ladies. Uh, many, almost all of them are over 60. Uh, many over 75. Uh, I have a question for Martin, uh, which is to do with the app. Um, Some of the concerns expressed by our members is with regards to the data on the app. So I wanted to just clarify uh, what sort of data is collected by the app, uh, where is it stored, and how secure it is. Because clearly, if if you're taking your phone everywhere, it is collecting all of that data. So um, those were some of the concerns before people were uh, ready to download the app. So I thought it would be best to ask for factual information on that. Thank you. Okay, I'm happy to take that one on. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer all of those questions right now, but what I will do is I will ask the uh, GCHQ team to provide an answer to that question, which is factually accurate. I do know that the government have put a huge amount of effort into making sure that the data is private and very secure. And I know that the app infrastructure makes it very difficult for people to get hold of that information without your express consent. But what we'll do is we'll get the information out from the app team uh, and, I'm, I'm, and I believe that you're talking about the NHS Test and Trace app. We will get the information yes. and it will come out in one of the subsequent bulletins, probably early next week, Monday or Tuesday, we'll do a special bulletin with Tim's permission to just get specific information because I have heard people's concerns around privacy around the app. I can tell you as an IT professional, I'm always very worried about how people's data might be shared. I looked at this earlier and Mm. I was confident enough as an IT professional to download it. So, but that's, that's a personal view. I will ask for factual information from the GCHQ team because they are the ones that I think the data together for the GDPR section. Tim? Yeah, and just uh, just to add, um, when you do download the app, uh, it doesn't actually collect any of your personal or sensitive information. So it downloads as a as a standard app, um, but then doesn't require you know registration or user ID or anything. Um, so what it will do, it, it connects via Bluetooth, and then it will tell you if you've come across anyone else that's also got Bluetooth on their the app, uh, and that's how it alerts you. Um, but yeah, we'll 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 follow that up with a bit of detail uh, next week. Okay, can I add something, please? So yeah. um, the app itself has a tab, it's about fourth one down, about this app, and that contains a very long spiel about the where the software is 
um, how it works, how the uh, how the, how it's kept confidential, and where the data is stored. That should answer quite a lot of Anita's questions. It's actually within the app. If you go into the about screen, fantastic. Thank you. That's great. So, Martin, I've got another question for you from uh, Sam Hussein. Uh, in the chat, is everyone forwarding the messages once uk? Can we receive messages via WhatsApp? Is that a possibility? Uh, and are you categorizing any in businesses in the, on this group? Uh, so I'm not seeing the distribution for this group, so I wouldn't know which are businesses and which are not. We don't currently ask that question when people sign up as a champion, although there is some work underway to look at some more information if people are prepared to share that with us. Um, sorry, Ramesh, what was the first question again, please? Um, can we receive messages via WhatsApp? Okay, so okay. everyone will know when you signed up, there was an option to give your uh, telephone number as well. That will be moved into a WhatsApp group, but before we start to use it, we will do a double opt-in. We will ask you again if you're okay to receive messages either via text or via WhatsApp. And at that point, the messages will come out via either email, WhatsApp, or text based upon your choices. Uh, Lorna, I've got another question in uh, the chat which says, what specific services are available in the community for the vulnerable? Um, can you expand on some of the stuff that's around or which websites or how they can uh, find out what's happening? Um, yeah, we've got um, there's the uh, Slough Get Involved website actually, which has quite a lot of um, activities <laughs> on there on the events page. So if we go and have a look at that, um, I think it's, it's um, www.slowgetinvolved.org.uk. Um, have a look at that. There's lots of activities uh, from community groups and things. We do circulate a newsletter that goes out to the voluntary sector as well. Um, yeah, loads of groups in Slough, about 400 different groups in Slough all doing different um, activities. Lorna, would you be able to type that uh, website link into the chat so that... Uh, do. Yeah. Right. Uh, Tim, there's a question for you, which is, um, is there currently a situation regarding increased COVID cases in Wexham Park Hospital? Are you able to tell us uh, yeah, good. Yeah, no, that's yeah, good question. Um, I don't have the exact data. Um, I don't. I don't think it's public. Uh, public knowledge, as far as I'm aware. What I do know is that there has been. Uh, there has been a slight increase um, across the country in terms of hospital admissions. I think one of the the concerns locally is that as we've seen uh, cases uh, progress through the age groups. So like I said, it, we we started in early September with. You know, younger people that's progressing to working age adults and that's progressing into to older adults the fear is that over the next sort of four to six weeks we'll see an increase in hospital admissions and, and more serious cases um so although i don't have that that level of data on me at the moment this is kind of what our, our modeling uh, is suggesting um i've got a question from mel i'm not sure it's to me privately or whether it's to everybody um so i'll pick that up in a bit, but uh, there is a question, Tim, for you from Jocelyn. Uh, how does the wake management work? Yeah, so the, our wake management offer, um, we've got various different things for, for people. So we have kind of app-based ones. We've got face-to-face uh, -face that we're looking at restarting fairly soon. Um, the one that uh, is particularly good for adults, we've got something called Shape Up for Life, um, which is a uh, kind of an online virtual uh, weight management program it comes with uh, set, uh, like uh, webinars uh, it has support by the app telephone support um, it's all it's all free of charge for people so if, if you want any any of that information then um, it's on the public health website uh, another question from to uh, this is from Teresa Carter is it true if you're in asda and someone in the store contract coronavirus you will be told to self-isolate even if you weren't near them tim <laughs> yeah that's a, good, that's a great question um it's it's unclear at the moment what uh the the the, uh, the qr code uh system is gonna is gonna be able to do um 
because what we don't know is obviously how long that person was in ASDA for, for example. Um, what, they're, what they're suggesting is that 15 minutes is around about the time that if you've, if you've been around that person in direct contact for 15 minutes, that's when you'll be alerted. Can you clarify for me, Tim, because uh, is it if I go to a place where I put the QR code in, or is it the fact that my phone is near another person in that place who had it? Which bit is going to kick something, if you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so it will kick for, for, for one of two reasons. So one is that if you've come into contact with some, someone via the Bluetooth, and that's if you, know, you walk past that sort of person or you spent time in the same vicinity, uh, and then the, the, the other reason is through the QR code. So, for example, if there was an outbreak uh, at a Tesco, so, for example, might have two or three members of staff that, uh, that are positive, um, they're then able to see who's also been in the store uh, at what time, and then they can get in contact with that person. And obviously, if that person's only been there for one or two minutes, then they're not at risk. Okay. Um, I don't think I've got any more questions and no more hands coming up other than um, uh, some of you are both a one slough uh, uh, participant uh, on community response as well as a um, community champion and I think there's no problem with those two roles uh, really um, and they are kind of slightly different uh, and it's worth being both that's fine if you're from a charity but if you're not from a charity um, uh, then the One Slough Community Champion is one way that you can help us to connect with uh, the local people in Slough, either through your friends, families, or your neighbours. Um, so Sam's asked a question, which is what else should champions do? Um, anybody, Tim or Martin? Yeah, well, so we've so we've got you know we, we've talked about um, you know whether you've got massive social media followings or whether you, you know you're prominent in the local community or a faith leader or you might be a teacher. Uh, for, for us, it's it's the the more people that we can engage with, the better. Um, so for those of you that uh, might just be on social media, then great, continue posting the key messages and everything that comes out. If you've got a prominent role in the community, whether you know, like you're a faith leader, if, we, if you're a, you know, a sports club um, captain, or what, whatever your role is in the community, that's where we're asking you to you know, put posters up. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're working on like a trainer trainer kind of um, presentation. So where we're able to give you those skills to be able to go out and, and you know, upskill other people. Um, so, so really it's as much as you physically can do. Uh, Sam, do you want to say anything about that train the trainer and maybe recruit people here? Yeah, I mean, we we know that from the statistics that Tim mentioned, um, again, it, if, affecting uh, people from the BAME community, uh, ages sort of 35 upwards, working age population. So we, I am looking to work with a colleague and we will come up with the train the trainer program. But if you would like to get involved and want to cascade those messages and enhance your community champion role, then let Lorna know your names and we'll start collecting names to, 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 to join that group. We'd love to have you. And so we'll make sure that gets promoted to all of the community champions when that's available. Yeah, uh, I've been a question, question from Jocelyn. Um, I think it's for Tim. Uh, is it possible to expand on immune health within the local community? You mentioned that immune health within the community. So, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, I think for me, there's uh, there's numerous ways that we can support our immune system, and actually, there's a really useful flyer that we've just created that picks up on some of those. But I've, you know, very very briefly touching on. Um, so we talked about the flu jab, we talked about physical inactivity, obesity, smoking, uh, alcohol, uh, vitamin D, uh, good quality sleep. All of these things directly contribute towards your immune system. Um, so. You know, there's lots of things to think about, but actually it's, it's how can we build those things in so they become habitual and we don't have to think about them. Um, that's definitely something that we can share uh, with champions, you know, in the next email. And as I think there was um, a couple of other questions, Ramesh. Um, yeah. So there was, um, vaccine. Yeah, so there was a question about the pneumonia vaccine and relating it to COVID. Um, so there are different types of pneumonia. Um, some of them bacterial, 
uh, infections that can be cured with antibiotics and some not and um, COVID does sometimes lead to uh, certain types of pneumonia. What we, don't, what, we, what we don't know is whether those types of pneumonia are protected via uh, vaccine or not. Um, I, think, I think not. So what I would say is that at the moment there's no real kind of link between uh, the vaccine and uh, COVID outcomes. But if you are, you know, if you can get vaccinated against pneumonia, then, then please do. Uh, and there's a question about uh, flu vaccines. Um, GP practices have different suppliers and they've been delivered at different times. Um, yeah, so there is, um, there's, there is capacity issues with, with, with the flu vaccine because they are trying to expand it to so many people. Um, some GP practices, the proactive ones, uh, ordered in a lot of vaccines. Uh, others are, are having to sort of play a bit of catch up. All sorry. Say sorry, Tim. Sorry to interrupt. Um, it was just a comment that I thought I'd make. Um, my name's Ariba. I work for East Berkshire CCG in, within the primary care team. So um, I just thought I'd make the comment that um, just to reassure the community in regards to it, because um, there's been a whole load of issues in regards to how much vaccination has been ordered. Um, and so um, just to assure everyone that um, we are working in terms of um, my organisation, we're working on uh, getting as much flu vaccination to a general practice as possible, but um, it's, it depends on supplier, um, uh, demand and supply, essentially. So that's what I thought I'd just put a comment there for you. Perfect. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. And I think I will just implore people that if, if you do get a challenge with, say, you know, your pharmacy is, is busy or if, if they're booked up for now, then, you know, keep trying. Um, and we're hoping that uh, you know over the next couple of weeks things will um, uh, will improve. Uh, there's a question from Dolly about uh, mental health outcomes for for teenage children uh, and for well children young people in general. Um, so there's just two things that I was going to mention. So one is uh, we offer on our website something called Health at Home, and the Health at Home section of our website is kind of everything that you can do to look after your health whilst you're at home. So whether you're in lockdown or whether you're in quarantine or isolating or whatever. We've got all that kind of support services and that covers both physical health and mental health, children, young people. And uh, yes. so there's the resources there. If people obviously want specialist services, if they're children, young people, they'll get referred uh, into something called CAMS, which is uh, delivered by the NHS Trust. Um, but there are you know, a huge range of services out there. So please uh, have a look. Thank you. So interestingly, we've got one question, which is, can we have these meetings at a different time? And I know that Mirish um, has planned some poll questions for us so that if uh, that will give us an idea of how you'd like uh, to be commun communicated to what the best options are. And so I'm going to pass it over to Mirish just to to ask the questions. Anything? Uh, I'll, uh, anything that we don't answer today, uh, we will try and pick up and send out the information by email. And if we've missed out a question, you can always contact us uh, on the, the OneSlayer website uh, and give us a, a, a question to, to answer for you. Martin, did you want to say something? Can I just ask one question? Sure. Yeah, Dolly, one question. Go ahead. It's Mary. Here. Very sorry. Is there any audio recordings for uh, visually impaired who cannot uh, read the text? Yeah, certainly, certainly. So I think we've we've recorded this uh, webinar. I think uh, which we can certainly um, we can certainly share, uh, and we can do you know tailored the ta resources. Yeah, yeah. So we can yeah. we can certainly do that, and we've got on our. Um, on our web on our website, we've also got uh, short like video clips which are uh, narrated uh, in different. Okay, languages. so I would like to have that because I, you know that I'm part of the talking newspaper. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll get uh, that connected to you, Mary. Okay, thank you. So, Martin, are you doing the poll? Or is Mirish doing the poll? Is Mirish doing the poll? Yes, I'm doing the poll and people are um, voting. So, um, do, do we just click? Everybody's, has everybody got the poll in front of them? 
and have they clicked when they would like? Um... 17 people have. Um... Okay, and we've got 31. So please complete your poll and then um, this will give us a very good insight into how we can make sure that these meetings are held at the time that you would like. Yeah, it's also just a, just a point back, uh, Ramesh, for Martin and yourself and me, um, is to the other 300 plus people that couldn't attend, just to use the same poll with them, if that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, we can do, we'll take that away and do it online to the people that couldn't attend. Thanks. So how many have done them so far, Mirish? 21. Oh. 21. Oh, there's a lot of lazy people around here. <laughs> 72%. Okay. Do, do you have the answers that we show or do we do that later? We can do that later if you or okay. we can share them if you want to. Okay. All right. So we've got about uh, four minutes to go before it ends. I just want to say thank you to everyone for participating. Um, and contributing and asking those kind of questions. Uh, like I said, uh, we will be emailing to everybody information on a weekly basis from Public Health to make sure that you've got the up-to-date information that you need to keep safe. Uh, where uh, it's very urgent or very important, we'll be using WhatsApp or texting to make sure that we can connect with you very, very fast in the future. Uh, probably not so much in the early stages, but later on if there is a second wave around November and December uh, where we need to, to inform you very quickly about anything. Uh, we would like to have regular sessions uh, like this one where we can invite experts uh, to present information and for you to ask those questions. That's either going to be monthly, every two weeks or weekly depending on what the polls say. Um, so um, Tim, do you want to say a final message or anything to everybody? Yeah, yeah just Sorry. just to say, yeah, no, just to say thank you, everyone, for dedicating your time this afternoon and for your support. I think, from a public health perspective, the, the way that we get, you know, the way that we see the end of this virus is is engaging with with residents, is, is engaging with people like you, utilizing your skills to get into those communities, but then also and, and really crucially is is giving you a platform to feedback. So that's give you a platform to feedback on, on the marketing and communications work, the local response, what's working, what's not, what's not working. Uh, and I would just implore all of you just to say that if, if, you, if you have some feedback, you know, don't be afraid to pass it over. If it's bad feedback or good feedback, whatever, we're here to listen uh, and, and to adapt our response accordingly. So please feel free to pass it on either directly through the, the, the One Style Community Champion platform or if you, if you want my details, then you're more than welcome to pass it on directly. So thank you. Okay. And thank you, Tim, for all the, uh, the expertise and information and for taking the time to come out here and to inform our, our champions uh, and being uh, a kind of a, a pilot for this, all right, because I know the first time we do it, it's a little bit harder. Um, Ramesh, can I just come everybody. in with one more thing? Ramesh, sure. can I come in with one more thing, please? Okay. Yeah. Um, there was a question about the app and how it works with venues. Um, I've been chasing that through the FAQ. It says if people with coronavirus were at the venue at a similar time to you, a human contact tracer dot, 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 will look into the case. So okay. I think that answers that question at the moment. So, so Teresa's question was, if I'm at ASDA and I get it, will I get uh, um, a phone call from Tracking? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. Yeah, and they'll risk uh, it based on the individual circumstances. Yeah. So my final message, and we've only got ooh, one minute, is stay well, stay safe, and together we can keep Slough safe. Thank you very much.